Hey everyone, Dennis Takama here. I wanted to bring you guys a quick little video. Now I had the chance to interview both Greg and Joe while we all worked together, so I took the opportunity to use Zoom and book a meeting with them to actually interview them, and there's a reason why. You see, the FGL group was one of these rare businesses that makes it into the top 2% of businesses that hit maximum levels of revenue, high levels of profit, and do all the right things. Now, the FGL group started in the 1970s as basically presenting locker room, and they grew up until 2011 to just do just under $2 billion in sales, and they sold to Canadian Tire for around $780 million. bucks. So on a business scale, these guys have been through and they've seen a lot of what's happened. Now, what's really cool about this interview is we specifically talk about economic recessions. And in fact, the entire interview is around how recessions were used to grow the FGL group and things that they did in the process, as well as Joe's history and Greg's history coming into this thing and actionable things that you need to look at today to not only survive this recession, but really thrive coming out the other side. So I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. Give it a watch. If you find it valuable, make sure you share it with your friends. You can always subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking the link below, and you can always be in touch with more and more business advice. And Greg and I always have different products that are rolling out that are specifically designed to help you guys grow through any kind of economic situation. So watch the video, enjoy it, leave your comments, let us know what you think. Yeah, my name is uh, my name is Joe Prezani. I was an uh, original co-founder, partner, in Prezani Group Limited, and. Uh, with that, we had uh, we we had Sport Check, but we had many other um, brand name stores, uh, of which uh, I ran R and R for about uh, 20, 25 years. R and R was a outdoor footwear and clothing specialty store. I uh, started working at Forzani Group when I was uh, little. You know, considered legal child labor, so. Probably wasn't paid, therefore it couldn't be child labor consideration. <laughs> they put, Dad put me to work actually when he figured out I could tell the difference between a clear hanger and a black hanger, and I had to sort them in the back. <laughs> I couldn't believe Greg. Greg was something like fourteen years old, and he's selling ski boots. I couldn't 12. believe that. And skis was it twelve? Oh, twelve. My God. <laughs> we, were, we were at that time. We were hurting for staff. I just got into the business, so. But Greg came across big time and God, how long did you stay in there? Like 20, 30 years in the sport Yeah, business? 25 years. 25 totally. years. Yeah, yeah, 25 years. And then uh, about 10 years ago, got into business coaching. So, uh, you know, advising businesses on how to make more profit and lower their stress while they're doing it. Well, um, we started off with one store uh, in the mid 70s. My brother John was, was mainly responsible for the idea and the concept. And uh, he brought, we were, uh, I was playing myself and my two brothers were playing for the Calgary Stampeders. And my brother John brought this concept to us. Uh, we'd all attended Utah State University, my, my two brothers and I. And he had a, my John had a friend of his that, that went to uh, LA, played with the Los Angeles Rams. And when now John was down there, he saw this concept of, of a footwear store called the Foot Locker. It's just started up mid seventies. And so John brought that forward to us while we were playing and said, listen, in order to take advantage of our name and, and our city status and what have you, why don't we open up a store and call it Prezani's and uh, take it from there. And hopefully uh, I, this thing's going to go big and the uh, footwear business is going to be unbelievable. I remember what, the first, what, what, I remember the first ad, liked? it was uh Remember the first ad? It was a big King, uh, King Kong gorilla cartoon yeah. character. You remember yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. We had no idea what we were doing at the start, but I'll tell you what, we stuck with it. But we did help. We did have help from the the whole sporting goods business that went on on fire here for the next twenty or thirty years, and uh, we uh, we were. It was nice that we had a nice situation right at the front end of it, and we grew with it. You know. Sporting goods got popular, but I wouldn't say it's because I wouldn't say the success was based on the sporting goods being on fire. Because honestly, the first uh, the first twenty years of growth came at the expense of uh, other sporting goods companies struggling and going down, and Forzani's yeah. locker room buying them out, taking them over, and expanding. That's really yeah, what that fueled the growth the first twenty years. Well, Greg, if you remember, when I first got into the business myself, um, 
I had, uh, by the mid seventies, when I finished football, I took a teaching assignment, uh, overseas, as you'll remember. And I taught school at a Canadian Air Force base in Germany. Meanwhile, Frizzani's had opened up the one store and was starting to grow. And I can remember when I was over there after about the second, I was there for three years after the second year, I remember getting a phone call from my brother, John. And he asked me, he said, Joe, he said, uh, you have a small share of the business. He said, um, would you like to sell? He said, I've got a great, I've got a manager that's really working overtime to help us out. And he'd like to buy your shares at double what you paid for. It. And I'm, I'm, I'm on a long distance call in Germany and that's before cell phones, that's before anything. It took an hour to get back to him sort of thing. But I thought about that overnight and I called him back the next day and I said, John, I said, thank you very much. I could use the money while I'm teaching over here because I was traveling all over. I think I visited, we, we visited 23 or 24 countries. But I said, John, I said, you know what? I believe in the concept. I believe in Frisani Group. I believe in your ingenuity. He said, I, I said, I'm not selling. Probably the best move I ever made in my life. Yeah, so no I did, I, you know, and I came back from, I came back from, from overseas. I quit teaching in, in the early 80s and I got a job at Petro Canada in the oil business. And I, I did that for three years. And then this, I, I, John approached me and he said, Joe, he says, we got this opportunity to buy a sporting goods company, as you said. That's struggling. That's struggling. <laughs> and I remember going in to look at it. It was on a Sunday. And we're going in and it was, oh, God, the staff was horrible. I remember the one staff member <laughs> on the phone, you know, yelling at some, at a customer saying that, you know, you're never allowed in this store, take all your business elsewhere. <laughs> oh my God, is this retail? You know, and the staff were dressed horribly. The, the store was really badly merchandised, poor lighting. I remember there was some red used carpet on the floor. It was terrible, awful. And John said, well, Joe, the reason it's bad is because we can get a really good price. And this is your way of, of getting into the business. You know, and about that same time in 1984, there was a, a major recession in Calgary, major recession. Oil prices went down to like two bucks. Hell, they're going down just like that today. And like everything was negative, 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 negative. And I had a nice job at Petro Canada. I was a landman. I was doing some half decent work, making a half decent salary. But, you know, I wasn't necessarily really happy. So I looked at this as a great opportunity because the deal was, was to take this concept, run it for like six, eight months, this Altoma Sports, fill it with some inventory from, Frisani, from the Frisani stores, and, and then have a big closeout sale for a month <laughs> and then reopen under a new concept. And I thought, wow, that sounds really interesting to me. There's a lot of oldness and there's a lot of newness and sporting goods really kind of turned me on. And I think I had the passion. I was in sports and I love sports. I played a lot of sports in high school and I love the sport. I love the communication with people. As a landman, it was all a lot of contract work and that wasn't my real cup of tea. So, so having said that I had those qualities, I committed to going forward with it. And I said yes to John after that uh, meeting at the store. That was and the first, uh, that was the first uh, big business. That was the first time we bought a struggling business out or the company bought right. a struggling business out and yep. uh, expanded from there. Right. And that was, that was one of many, 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 many struggling businesses that Forzani Group bought out during struggling times. And I remember that because remember we went and went to all the suppliers, uh, bought a whole bunch of inventory <laughs> at a deal because they were struggling because yeah. of recession, right? So we yeah. turned the whole recession into a big positive and an opportunity. And we bought tons and tons of inventory from suppliers that were struggling, bought that business that was struggling, their inventory for, for pennies on the dollar. And I'll never forget that. They're dead. It's struggling. We put all the newspaper up in the windows. Remember, we covered all the windows in the mall to the store. And we yeah. cut little square holes, yay big, <laughs> for people to look in to see what was going on inside. And we put big signs out front said, huge sale. 
And the very first day, there was a lineup all the way down the mall, out the door, into the parking lot. Like, we're talking like a 1,000 people lined up. We had to hire security. Because yep. at the time, you don't think about hiring security for a store sale. Yep. <laughs> and it went on like that for – and that was the day Dad said, uh, you got to get out here, stop sorting hangers. We need you on the sales floor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. we're really short-staffed. <laughs> yeah, I remember you. And that, that was the beginning. Then it was the business after business after business after business through each downturn, buying yep. them. You know, taking advantage of the marketplace to say, hey, what's out there we can buy, put in, uh, flip it to the customer and grow. That was yep. huge. Oh, I agree. Um, you know, I remember we were just going to run that closeout sale for one month. We ended up running it for two months. <laughs> and I think we did more sales than the previous guy did in 10 years, yeah, like in sure. two months. For you know, sure. it just, it's amazing uh, what we have at our fingertips. You know, Greg, I think one of the things – we did really well as a, as a company, as for Zanny Group. And I think John, may, it mainly came from, from the top, but, you know, we were all, we'll, we were involved in it. But one of the things we did really well, we did basics well. We, basic things like, like inventory, like buying distressed items, budgeting distressed items, merchandising, having well-lit stores. Uh, you know, we, we did those things well, really well. And I, and I think that, you know, as I look back at some of the stores that never made it, you know, they never spent much time on, I think they, they, they kind of heard that times are tough and, you know, they're, they're probably not going to make it. And they got into that whole, that whole uh, sort of aura of, of negativity. And I, I Sticking really their head that, in the sand. Yeah, you can go around and you, you can see stores that are in that negativity today, whether they're sporting goods or wherever they are they're just sort of run down but you can tell a store of where that person has the the commitment and the passion uh and to take care of things but you know what you don't have to go to extremes it's basic stuff you got to take care of and and you know i, I think that's most important you have to understand your financials yeah, oh yeah. you got to reorganize the financials in a profitable manner, which comes with, I remember, really difficult decisions. Like it might mean letting people go, it might mean restructuring, it might mean getting out of leases, whatever, reconfiguring, might mean changing locations because one's not profitable, I mean, whatever. Third thing was we made sure we understood what our pricing needed to be, meaning what our gross margin percent had to be to make yep. a profit, period. And then the fourth one was easy. You gotta, you gotta go at it hard with how do I increase my gross margin percent? You know, whether it's changing product services, like we did find distressed products, whatever it was, repricing stuff. And the fifth one was you got to be diligent and hard on your expenses. What, you know, what are the ones you have to have and what are the ones we didn't have to have? And that became an easy formula of five steps where we bought, I mean, I, I don't even remember how many companies Forzani Group bought out to grow, but, but bottom line is if you really go back in history, that was what was done through history to get that company from one store to 1.7 billion or whatever in revenue. The big thing is yep. buying out distressed companies doing those five things. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree. Um, I remember one of the philosophies that came through the company was that we were going to be a, a low cost operator. Yeah. And though, even though we had really nice stores and nice locations or whatever, Behind the scenes, we were a low-cost operator. We didn't we didn't blow a lot of money. Whenever we flew, it was always uh, it was always economy class, never first class, never. Yeah, exactly. But but you know, whenever we stayed in hotels, it was always sort of second, third-rate hotels close to our suppliers. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, yeah. we always used to negotiate travel into into buying, so so they would pay for it. So. Every time, you know, so here's a great example of what you just said, just, and obviously the, the late, great, your brother, John, um, I think, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first time he bought a brand new car was when he actually fully retired and stepped down as chairman and the company was sold to Canadian Tire. I think it's the yeah. first time he bought a brand new car. Every other time was right. used. And, and here's a guy that, you know, could have said to anybody, absolutely, you could buy a brand new car and you could buy any car you wanted. Yeah. Philosophy, right? Yeah, for sure. Who is it? Warren Buffett still has a nine, it still drives a 1986 meteor, you know, to work and back and it still lives in the, 
in the same house that he has been yeah, living in exactly. in the last 20 or 30 years. And the guy's like worth uh, worth a hundred million, you know, maybe yeah. more. So, I mean, uh, it's all, it's, it's not about that business and, and success isn't necessarily about the total material things, although they're there if you want them, but it's more about, uh, it's more about success and it's more about, uh, accomplishing goals and, and, uh, you know, making yourself feel good because you're in it for, for helping others or whatever it is, your values, value structure it is. But, um, that's a great but point, I, actually. You know, that was, I would say that was John's and yours and Baz's philosophy from day one, which was to actually, uh, one, help and provide for the team, the people working there. Absolutely. And they all felt like that. They were loyal to yep. beyond loyal because they felt that. And number two, um, providing for the customer, right? Like providing an honest value for the customer. But one thing that, you know, you guys instilled in everybody and myself right from day one was you can't do that. You can't do that unless you're healthy, profitable first, you know, the same old oh, story, absolutely. you get on an airplane, you get on an airplane and what's the, what's the lesson they give you when they tell you the emergency instructions, you got to put your own mask on first before you can help yeah. others. So companies yeah. got to be healthy True. before they can provide all that other stuff. You guys taught me that a long, 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 long time ago. Yeah, you know, Greg, yeah, you know, that's very, very true. Um, one of the things, too, um, we always seem to add, we followed trends well. I don't know what it was, but we we had a passion for following trends. And it, it, it just seemed like in, in the 25, 27 years that I was in the business, that we were always the first guy in on, on following a trend. If we weren't the first, we were right at the very front. And um, when we found those trends, we like, Greg, we went right after it. Like, like a guy after five home runs in a game. I mean, <laughs> we went, we were thirsty to get more inventory in those trends or, or do whatever we needed to do. And uh, that made us very special. We, uh, our customers began to follow us and like the fact that we had all this newness all the time. We had a sense of newness, a sense of pride, a sense of, uh, you know, we've got what you, what you want. And, you know, it's going to be here in six months, but we're ahead of the game. And they like that. And those trends all started in downturns. And oh. the reason was, and the reason was, we got to think differently. Where's the market going to be when this downturn's done? The world's going to change. What's it going to look like? Where do we need to position ourselves? Case in point, your, your example, that first business that was bought out, that was when we went from, you know, a small concept athletic shoe store to That's right. medium-sized concept general sporting goods store, right? Correct. It was like, hey, Good we could do general sporting goods. And then that led to, you know, different category, different. So every time there was a downturn, it was like, hey, where can we expand? What's going to be the new cool trend and thing? And let's get on it and be there and, be ready when the market bounces back. Yeah, I love it. That was that's a good point. Yeah, and I, I think another thing um, is, is is the fact to be creative. I, I think you've got to be creative with your ideas. You know, you know, even today, I had a friend of mine. I I sometimes proof he he's, he's a blogger, and he sends these blogs to me, and I, I proof read them, and I and uh, I sort of correct a lot of his grammar and stuff and spelling and, and send them back to him. So he's going to sell his condo, this guy. They just got it this morning. And so, so what he's going to do, he came down in price, but he's going to throw in a car with the purchase of the condo. And I said, like, like, I've never heard of that before. He said, you wait and see. He says, I've got a Mercedes. It's an older Mercedes or, or an MG. And it's their choice. They can take the car. They both run. And so they created an ad, buy a house and get a free car. Like, <laughs> hey, listen, there's a recession on out there. Who knows? I have no yeah. idea. Like, uh, obviously, it's a gift with purchase. But, uh, you know, when you're going through a recession, there's a sense of evaluation that takes place. It's oh, like, yeah. am I worthy? Like, do I have it? Do I have it? Like, is the world really going to come to an end? 
I was talking to a girl on on an airplane uh, three or four weeks ago. I, by the way, I did my self isolation, so I'm okay. But her comment was that you know this thing is going to get carried away and it's going to go crazy and like everybody's going to die on the streets. It's going to be horrible. It's going to be awful. And I said, how long is this going to take? Oh, she said it's going to take. Oh, I don't know, three or four weeks. I said, you mean this whole world's going to come apart? Everything's going to go to go to hell. We're going to be totally in limbo in three or four weeks. <laughs> she said, yeah. I said, well, really? You know, so, so I mean, the, the, the point being made is this. I think when all this is said and done, people are still going to get up in the morning. They're still going to eat. They're still going to, you know, go to work. There's still going to be jobs. Government's going to help with a lot of money to, to get kickstart this thing. Now, but there's going to be a whole new set of rules. There's new values already starting. People maybe aren't going to spend as much. Like, you know what? There's going to be half the dollars out there. So if there's half the spending dollars, you're in competition with half of the money that's out there. So how are you going to be more special? So you, it's a sense of evaluating, reevaluating where you are. What's your why? How are you going to adjust? How are you going to be different? How are you going to be new? And um, I really believe if you've got the passion and the creativity, deep down, and the positive yesness to your voice and your manners, I think, uh, you know, I think you give it the best shot you can. But, uh, but, but, uh, and, and, I, and I, the basic business fundamentals, like you mentioned earlier. Oh, absolutely. <coughs> Do the basic stuff really well. You know, like if you're in home care, make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're following everything to a T, even better, that you're hiring the best possible people with the most compassion, that you're in the best, you know, that you're offering, that your prices are, are in line and profitable. Cut down on any expense that you've got, needless expense. And um, sort of, you know, whether it's retail, whatever it is, do the basics well. Excel at it. So if, if you had to um, go back and look at, all this, look at all the growth you've gone through through all the recessions, what would you guys say that you guys did entering every recession that helped you guys get through it and successfully? Yeah. Have to, have to, have to, have to. If there's a list of 10, the first nine, you have to be profitable going in. Have yeah. to. If you're not, excuse my language, you're, you're fucked. You can adjust what you want, but you got to, it's that much harder work. You have to be profitable going in. So number one, first and you, foremost. you say profitable, you mean what? Net profit, gross profit? I mean, net profit after paying all the managers, owners, directors, whatever, fair market wage. There has to be a profit after that wage is paid, a fair market wage. Yeah, but what about all those profit. people that say that, well, I'm not going to be profitable because I don't want to pay taxes? <laughs> well, well, okay, great point. Those people that say, I don't want to be profitable because I don't want to pay taxes means they got to spend that money somewhere. So now you got a choice. You can spend that money on useless stuff for whatever it is that just goes away and you don't pay tax. But let's be honest, at the end of the day, if you pay tax, it actually means you made a profit and you got money, you got, you got money equity. Second thing you could do to not pay tax is take that what would be profit and reinvest it to grow the business in a profitable way, which means you're just deferring the tax to be honest. Yeah. You know, Greg, I think one of the things too, I, I agree with wholeheartedly what you say, but, you know, in order to become more profitable, I think, like, we, I can approach it from a retail perspective, and I can say this. I can remember Greg. Greg was the buyer. He, he was the buyer with, uh, with, my, with the R&R &R concept. He was an owner and a buyer. But I can remember, Greg, sitting down in meetings with you, and before the recession, you were dealing with 35 shoe companies. Hmm. And you were dealing with 20 clothing companies mm -hmm. and you were dealing with 42 accessory companies, mm -hmm. like 42 accessory. And all these people <laughs> had their own billing and they had their own way of, of structuring their financial and their shipping and all this. Well, that's great when times are great, but what we, what it turned out, we did the evaluation. We found out that we were making 80% of our money on 20% of those suppliers. 
So why yeah, are we last, carrying all this yeah. load? Remember that? So yeah. we cut all those guys out. We went with the 10 best with the 10. Oh, did we turn profits? We turned yeah. profits and, and, and less shrink. We, tend, we turned profits and, and turning our inventory faster because that's what people wanted with those. So that's really, really important. You know, and you could do the same thing with your expenses. You know, you could find out what you're, what you're spending money on. And, uh, you know, we got to a point, Greg, if you can remember, we put budgets on all our expenses. Like yeah. our managers around the stores, they had a certain amount that they could spend. That was it. I can remember a manager one time calling me up and said, Joe, I need more pens. I said, what are you doing with the pens? I said, you're not getting any more pens. You have to bring them from work. You know, my point was, we watched every dime that left and we, and we carried the inventory that people wanted from those suppliers. Boy, did that ever work, eh, Greg? Yeah, like and then really the inventory worked. that the inventory they didn't want that was sitting around, we just turned into cash real quick and stopped buying stuff. So that's right. Got better at it, you know, for sure. It'd be somebody like that's in the that's in the, uh, you know, sort of that's in the plumbing business or the uh, home um, home um, carpentry business or whatever, you know, trying to do business with everybody. You know, maybe there's a certain group that you got to figure out where you're getting your money from, a certain income level, a certain whatever. And those are the ones you got to go after and not the whiners at the bottom and not the, the super rich at the top. But uh, I mean, you, you've got to evaluate your, your customer and, and do the things that you can turn the most and the greatest in the greatest. Um, well, I'm saying inventory turns, but the, so you can get the most amount of money at the highest possible pro profit uh, with no problems. And to do that, you got to, totally understand your numbers, your P and L yeah. you got to be able to understand how to reconfigure it to be able to make decisions like you just talked about. And then you use those reconfigured numbers to be able to understand what customer types, what product types, what vendors, what categories, yeah. what services, whatever that are profitable that allow you to become profitable. Um, that's, yeah, great. If you don't, and that's your basics. That's your fundamentals, yeah. right? That's if you don't have that stuff in place, you're dead in the water. You're Dennis, to totally your point, agree. you always say if it's like going to a poker game without knowing the rules and playing with real money, you're, yeah. you're dead in the water. You know, Greg, I can remember when, again, before some recessions, we had X amount of money. We used to take around two, two and a half percent of our, of our total sales and put it towards advertising. And we threw out these ads and now this is before the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the computer and things, but, we used to do radio. We used to do newspaper, magazines. We used to do all those things. TV. And we used to, oh, yeah. Oh, we took lots of money for our company, 2 3%. And I can remember, Greg, when we would have these sales, we would just do the ads and just run the ads and forget about it. And hopefully that it worked. We, And I can remember when you came to me one time and said, you know, Dad, we got to sit down and we got to discuss this. He said, every time we run a newspaper ad, we're not getting spike sales. So what are we doing with that money? Why are we spending that money? And I remember at that time when we only had 12 or 14 stores, I can remember we were spending close to like seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in advertising. So, geez. So what we started to do was when we, when we did an ad, we would evaluate it. We went back and we took a look at sales and we evaluated the sales to see if that brought in not only more dollars, but more profit dollars. And if it did, we knew what, what kind of ad we would run. If it didn't work, we scrapped it. And I think, Greg, I think we, we went down and took a lot of that money. Like if we spent 800,000 for the year, we took, we went down to 200,000. We took the other money and we made our stores look better. We yeah. invested in better lighting because we were in shopping centers. We better window in better signage. Rocking, better window signage. Uh, we did some rentals. Oh, did that ever work? Yeah. Now, there are th these are changes that came out because of the recession and because we had to do it. And did they ever work? So really evaluating your company from your profit and loss statement, that's where you got to start. I mean, that's really where you got to start. And the how-to, but how, that tells you where you're making your money or where you're losing your money. 
but you know, I mean, there's so many different different situations. I could I could go through very many things that that we used to do that we didn't do anymore because we were spending the money and it was needlessly spent. And you can you can get away with it in good times, but in bad times, like that, like what's going to come up? There's half the spending money around, so you're really in competition. So you really got to be sharp about where you position yourself, what you buy, and how you spend. So would you guys say you would have got to the level you guys got to without recessions? <laughs> I don't think we would have. Personally, I don't think we would have. I don't think – I think if you look at the journey of Forzani Group, as Dad mentioned, mid-'70s, open with one store, um, grew to give or take 60 got to a point where an opportunity popped up to buy our biggest competitor, which was sport check. That was done in a recession when sport check didn't know what they were doing. was yeah, failing. Yeah. Sport check was only four stores at the time, uh, but our main competitor, um, they were failing, didn't know what they were doing. We knew what we were doing. Recession hits, boom, they're in big trouble. Uh, they want to, you know, they got to be sold, get out, whatever. So that gave us that opportunity. Then sport check grew, boom, another recession hits and we buy out our main competitor. And our main competitor at the time was Sports Experts out east, and that allowed us to do that. And yep. sorry, back to the 60 stores. Uh, we got from one to 60 stores through buying out competitors who were struggling in tough economic times. Like it, without yep. those recessions, personally, I don't think there's any way Porzani Group gets to that size in that number of years. Maybe in another 20 yeah, years after that, but not in the number of years it did it. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Um, and we just had, we just had, we just had the right attitude that we went about to do that too. Nobody was going to beat us. Like that was our our whole philosophy. Like nobody was. Even Greg, when we uh, we we bought uh, uh, what's the company? Uh, uh, the company best Intersport, not Intersport, uh, um, Sport Experts. Sports Experts. You know. We uh, we drowned there when we first bought them. We got into some financial problems. Like everybody has financial problems. Like I just want to make one point clear: that if you're in business, uh, there's very few people, like very few companies, if any, that have not had financial problems and, and verged on bankruptcy. Very, very few. I, but I, I, to expand but, on that, it's there's no way in the world a company can be that much of an expert without having faced financial oh, issues like you're talking about. Cause that's how you learn. You don't, Absolutely. you don't learn this shit in school. You, you, they don't teach it in school. That's an education you got to learn on the street. And but if you great. haven't been through it, then you don't know it exists. You don't know the signs coming. You don't know what's, what to look for. And you sure as hell don't know how to deal with it. So great. yeah, hundred percent agree with that. What great lessons those are. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Money I can't buy those lessons. lessons. Technically, money does buy those lessons because you go through the tough time, but it's an education you can't get in school. You can't, and you can't, you can't plan for it unless you go through it. So, yeah, absolutely. Going through that changed everything. Absolutely. Not. Going through those tough times that you're talking about was really the foundation of what triggered this program, right? So others don't have to go through it. So we can take that lesson, what we learned, what we had to do, and go show others so they don't have to go through that lesson that we went through because, fuck, man, for two years, that was, that was, that was hell in a cell. That was, that was yeah, a for, for two years. That yeah. was, you know, when they say sleep in your office, I slept in my office for a lot during those two years because yeah. my commute to work was 45 minutes, so I needed to work extra, so I slept in the damn office. Like, it was, you know, you wake up in the morning with your, cheeks stuck to your freaking you know chair um, but what we learned is now what we're teaching others that's because that's yeah that's very true yeah yep absolutely greg um i know that in retail you've had a tremendous amount of uh experience and knowledge of the different uh, plateaus that we went through oh my but uh i know that you're doing a great job as a business coach with and uh you know, I think that's fantastic that you're sharing that knowledge. You know, I think that's really good. And I know it's you've a got a small great and partner. medium business is a chance to compete, right? That's that's yeah. what this is all about. Because 
you know, that's growing up in the environment I grew up with you guys, which was start, you know, one store entrepreneur, look what it grew into and look at how many people it impacted. Cause there's a lot of people that worked in that company that learned those lessons that are now, you know, I go through my LinkedIn or yeah, Facebook yeah. profiles. They're doing some really amazing things. Like those yeah, people are true. out there running companies and doing amazing things. And yeah, they learned those true. fundamental lessons there. Right. So yep. that's the whole point of this program. Why we started, you know, 10 years ago was to, <clears throat> Go give others that same opportunity and give them the chance yep. to compete with bigger companies, Absolutely. corporations, national chains. Because national chains have the business know-how, but in a lot of cases, they don't have the creativity, innovation, desire, and reactiveness. So take small, medium business with that you know, innovation, creativity, desire. Give them the business knowledge the corporations have, and bang, they got an upper hand. It's pretty You cool. know, Greg, I was, I was watching uh, the movie Titanic last night. <laughs> I watched it up until they hit the iceberg. <coughs> and then I didn't want to go through all the negative. I wanted to have a good night's sleep, so I went to bed. <laughs> but my point is this. They had two guys. They were on the Titanic. The two watchmen were watching for that iceberg. And they didn't have binoculars, but they saw the iceberg, and they relayed down to the, uh, to the main guys, to the main engineers there. Turn the ship, turn the ship. And they so they and turned, backed it up, and they turned it. But the ship was so large, it took so much time to turn that they actually hit the iceberg. And my point is this. When you talk about the big majors in whatever, whether it's retail or whatever whatever uh, business that you're talking about, they what they want to move, it takes time to move. Like they can't just move, you know, they've got inventory, they got staff, they got all these, look at a Walmart or a Costco. Oh my God. To do something different would be uh, unbelievably hard. Whereas a smaller retailer, a more niche market, you can move quick. I mean, you can just, you know, eliminate five or six guys. And you can do this. You can do things quick and, and get on track quicker and, uh, and, and make more money quicker. You can, Cut your expenses quicker. I'm just saying that's the advantage of the independent today. That's huge. Hey, Dennis, like I think you can attest in the last 10 years or however long we've been working together, how many, what percentage of clients are we seeing we start working with that like, literally we're able to help them turn around within 90 days. It's freaking yeah, insane. Exactly. No corporation to that's going no. to do that. No, you yeah, absolutely. You'd have, to have, so true. you'd have to have 52 meetings. <laughs> you know, to all different levels. Oh my! If you've got a, a, a if you've got a manager and his key employer, you can do something like like overnight, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, but I know that companies that deal with both you and Dennis are very fortunate because you guys can give them ideas. You guys can work with them on the process. You guys can, you know, give them the business knowledge that's so required. And you know, sometimes. Sometimes the change can be very small, but, but it can be really effective. And, um, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. If, 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 if I had the opportunity to have business coaches when I was just starting off in business, I would have done that in a, in a, in a New York second. But back when I started, back in the, in the 70s and 80s and even 90s, there wasn't business coaches. I mean, there was your, there was your accountant that, that kind of didn't know what the hell was going on. It used to scare me that I was going to go bankrupt all the time. And then there was, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lawyer that used to say, you know, worry me about that. I got all the right contracts. But, you know, the fact of the matter is you got to run that business and you got to pull in money and you got to make sure you pull in more than you spend. And, uh, and that requires you and focus. And anytime you can get really good sound knowledge from people that, that have experienced businesses before, you know, you guys are really fortunate. As far as going back in time, I think the one area that most business owners miss out on is the numbers and the financials. And I know when you and I did an event in Leduc, you would talk to people about, and you and I even talked at a dinner table, that you had hired professionals to teach you an income statement. Things that you yep. actually went out of your way to learn so if yeah. you were to go and counsel a lot of people that are in business now, what would you say around the number side of things? My brother, John, 
was would help me out, you know, for, with, with, with the business owners because, you know, it's really hard to do everything. Like, if you're running a business, to keep track of what the new trends are and your staff and, and whatever project or ever, however you're making money, that's really difficult. And then to keep track of the money behind it, you, need, you know, you need really good help, really good professionals. But my brother John helped me out when I first got into the business, but he didn't have the time. So I used to go see my accountants. And I mean, those are the only people I could go to. I mean, you can go to your staff, but, you know, your staff really aren't invested in, in the company. So, I mean, I know they're trying, but and so if to your question, if I could go to somebody today, it would be a knowledgeable, experienced business coach that I could share my business and get another point of view with somebody that's experienced that's on my side. I think that's key today. That's key. I mean, if you can make, if you can go forward and make less mistakes, but just as much or more profit, why not? Like, why yeah, not? Why do you have to go through all these headaches and near bankruptcy and killing and your wife yelling at you and you're, <laughs> oh, you don't need that. You know, if, 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 if you've got some good, strong business coaches, I mean, and I'm talking business coaches. There's a fine line, in my opinion, between business coaching and life coaching. And, you know, I love life coaches and to make the right decisions and what we're trying to do or whatever. But business coaches, the difference is business. They understand business. They understand profit and loss statements. They understand margins. They understand expenses. They understand profit dollars. They understand all those things. And if you can get a better understanding as a client for your own business, you know, the sky's the limit. You got to do your homework and make sure they have the experience, the track record, the knowledge, the know-how on, on how to get you there and help you. Cause you know, obviously everybody's resume is different. Yeah. There's an old saying I love, which is uh, hard times bring, bring strong men, strong men bring good times. Good times bring weak men. Weak men bring hard times, right? So when you take a look at those yeah. recessions, how important yeah. do you think they are for allowing those that know what they're doing to rise to the surface versus those that don't? I think it's spot on. I think you're 100% spot on. And, and uh, I think the comment's spot on. And I think the people who know how to succeed in a normal environment and succeed actually means, you know, you succeed in business, to your point, Dennis, you succeed in business, you're going to have a social responsibility to provide for the customer because you have a service or a product that they need or want it's a, that's needed in the marketplace. And you have a social responsibility to employ people. And, and at the end of the day, you know, if you make money, um, you pay tax. If you employ people, those people pay tax. Those taxes in difficult times fund the government to help people in need. So it's actually, you know, to your question to answer it, in my opinion, it's actually up to, it's, it's the social responsibility of the successful businesses to actually expand and acquire other companies who can't figure it out because in these tough times, more people need help and they need to be leaders in the, in the community and, and take up and, and expand to make those other businesses profitable. That that's, it's huge. It's, um, that's what's going to make the economy keep ticking. Otherwise, we all stick our head in the sand and rely on the government. And the government's already taxed out as they are with time and money as it is. You know, they can't, they can try and help, but are they going to solve the problem? No, it's, it's businesses that got to solve the problem. They got to provide. Yeah, you know, Dennis, I, I don't think it's necessary that necessarily the time where people after a recession to go out and buy a company. It's not necessarily the time. I remember for us. If you have the reserves, it is. Yeah. Or, well, if, you can, or, if, you can structure, or if you can structure the deal creatively enough that you can afford it, then it's a great time. I remember for with us, Greg, is that we would mosey along and companies would phone us up and ask if, if you're interested in buying this company or that company and, 
and we would always look at it. And then if it looked really good and it added to our, our, uh, our market area and uh, it looked like it would be a profitable situation for us, we'd go see our banker and we'd bring him in and we'd look at the projected sales and, uh, and make a call. You know what I mean? So, so it's not, it's, it's like if, if you can, if, if the people that you're coaching can run profitable businesses. I think that's number one. You got to be profitable. If you're profitable, you're riding that bike, like you're moving. And who knows what might come along? You know, a bigger bike, you know, a faster bike, who knows? But More you've bikes. Gotta get to, you've <laughs> got to get to that stage. You can't keep thumbing. You can't keep, you know, sort of hoping and wishing that this is going to get better. And you can't get into that negative thought. You know, you just got to make it work. Yeah. Agreed. By using the resources that's around you. So from your perspective, is it easier to grow a company in a recession, like in a bear market or in a bull market? I would answer that two ways. It's potentially easier to grow revenue in a bull market because the, the market's growing. Therefore, yeah. you're growing with it but you're not necessarily growing market share um, or you might be growing a little bit market share. It's easier to grow market share because you know, the, the market's shrinking. If you're growing your piece of the pie, then you're growing market share, which may not necessarily immediately relate to revenue. However, when the market bounces back and grows, you got a larger percentage of the market share, a bigger piece of the pie of that growing market. So my answer would be in a down economic time. Well, that's when the opportunities prevail too, Greg. Exactly. Because when, when times are good, everybody's good, generally speaking. And, that, and there's a bunch of new you know people I mean? getting in the game, right? When times right. are good, there's new yeah, people getting yeah, in the game. So yeah, your market absolutely. share shrinks. There you go. Exactly. You know, it's, it's like the stock market. You take a look at the stock market. I don't know on the TSX. I don't know how many stocks there are. I don't know what three, four, five hundred, <laughs> maybe more, maybe a thousand. But you know what? When on good times, people buy all these different stocks. They got juniors and they got uh, startups. They've got some of the top notch uh, blue chip, whatever. They're all over the board. But you know, when times are tough and the market falls, guess where they go? They hmm. go to the blue chip, or they hmm. go to gold because they want security, you know, and it's the same thing in running a business, you know, where do we go? Like you got to go, each business has their own um, blue chip mentality. They've got their own gifts and you got to go to those gifts. You got to go to what, what made you, what got you there. And you got to start expanding that. And I think if you're going to expand, you better have your systems in place, you know, and, and you better be ready to expand yeah so and I, i'm not saying you know if you just rush in and times are tough and and then you all of a sudden you buy all the you know th then you got more of a problem on your hands but no that's a gold nugget you just said there that that's huge don't get the people can't misinterpret this message the message isn't just go expand no the message is you better a be profitable and b have what you just said your systems in place so that when yeah. you expand you can rely on those systems Right. And when we say systems, we don't necessarily mean computer systems and software. We mean processes and tools in place yeah. to create exactly. a system that makes sure that you're exactly. predictably profitable. And you know what the hell's going on. Yeah, that's a huge deal. That's uh, that, yeah. that, yeah, good. I'm yeah. glad you brought that up. Um, yeah. There's always people that are going up there. Well, if you made it so good in business, why would you get into training or teaching? Right. So from your perspective, what do you think from what you guys are successful is, why would you get into teaching and training after having business success? Well, I think it's sort of a natural flow. Um, you know, been through, been through the, the grind, been through the, the high side and uh, all that's been very rewarding, but you know, to, uh, to help others uh, get into the same sort of mode and uh and and experience success through some of the through some of the uh, policies and procedures that got us going i think that's personal satisfaction um you know i was uh 
can't, if you go back in my in my background, I was uh, a counselor. I got my uh, master's degree in counseling, and so I've always been one to to help others. And uh, this is a way of me helping others is through through business because I know it's a very tough thing to do is to own your own business, but it can be extremely gratifying. But you need help. You can't do it alone. So then this is going to bring to the other question that the cynics always put out there, which is, well, if you're so good at it, you made so much money, why would you charge for advice versus giving it for free? Yeah, but what's, what's free, Dennis? What's free in this world? <laughs> like, you know, very few places. And I, I, I feel that, you know, myself, Greg, and yourself, Dennis, that, that, your, that your information is valuable and that uh, if people, by people buying it, and using it, uh, they'll probably feel a lot. Well, what I'm saying is, they're going to use it more than just getting it free. I mean, bottom line is, when you get advice for free, you don't value it, you don't do the work, right? Exactly. You don't commit to it, you don't have the passion. Therefore, you don't get the result. And here's just a crazy analogy to drive the point home. If someone gave you two free tickets to a sporting event, a hockey game. Yeah. You may or may not go, but if you yeah. buy two tickets to a sporting event or a hockey game and you bought them, yeah, true. you will go. True. Or you'll Same. sell them to somebody else. Oh, oh yeah, right. <laughs> Cause you value them. Absolutely. And, and a hundred in 10 years, a hundred percent of the time, a hundred percent of the time, let me say that again, a hundred percent of the time when I give free advice, they either don't do it, they do a little bit of it, they don't really apply themselves, they don't implement it, they don't get the result. When they pay for it, they get the result and then they realize the return on that investment is more than multiplied many, many times over. I give a lot of free advice. And you know what? People don't listen. They don't really, I don't know what it is. They, they seem like they can, they can do it their own way. They've got their own, and you know what? At that point, Go for it, man. I, you know, it, it makes no difference to me. But if somebody wants to really get to the bottom of it and really is serious about where they're going or what they're doing and seriously wants to improve and seriously wants to make something of what they've got, then I think there's professionals out there, just like lawyers and accountants, there's business coaches. And they're loaded with money. They've been through it. They do charge, but boy, do they give you results. And that's a serious way of looking at it. There's nothing in this life, and everybody that owns a business knows this, there's nothing in this life that's for free. You know that. So, um, you know, so having said that, I, I, I think those that are, that are really, you know, have a purpose and, and really want to make something of what they've got, you know, you've got to go see business coaches. You've got to see... Like, and, and they will guide you accordingly in business.